Don't we all know this guy, William Wallace, fought bravely for Scotland in the name of freedom! Clearly dressed to impress. Well, we don't exactly know William Wallace. This guy certainly isn't him, in numerous ways, but we'll get back to that. There is a lack of source material on this guy, and even what we do have is a bit questionable. But if we don't really know too much about him, how did he become a hero in the first place? All it took was one very important battle. Two bands of Scottish rebels joined together on a field to face one English army. Between them, a bridge. Stirling Bridge. But why were all these people here? To explain that, we'll have to backtrack a little. It's the late 13th century. Scotland has a pretty good king, but he dies, leaving the throne to his three-year-old granddaughter. Four years later, she dies, leaving nobody to inherit the throne directly. This was called the Great Cause of 1291. Vying factions try to claim the throne, and who do they turn to? The King of England. No, seriously. Rather brilliantly, Edward demanded to be named Overlord of Scotland before he made this decision. You know, just in case. Edward chose King John, thinking him to be the perfect loyal puppet king. But just four years later, when Edward called on John for Scotland's support against the French, John was already making alliances with the French behind Edward's back. Cue a huge fight. King John lost and gave up his crown. King Edward regained control over Scotland as its official overlord. The English occupation and oppression understandably left the people of Scotland quite unhappy, leading to a rebellion. Two factions, the first from the north led by a prominent Scottish noble, Andrew Murray, the second from the south led by William Wallace. These are the first events that introduce us to William Wallace, the historical figure. Before this, there are no concrete details about his lineage or life. All we know is that he was involved in these rebellions and eventually became to lead this faction with some success. It isn't until the Battle of Stirling Bridge that William Wallace becomes William Wallace. On September 11th, 1297, an English force led by this guy made their way to Stirling Bridge. Here they would face the now combined forces of Murray and Wallace. But why was this battle so important? Stirling itself was the perfect location for the battle over Scotland. This was where access and control over Scotland could be won or lost by either side. The English army consisted of a reported 6,000 infantry and 300 horses. They were a well-trained and disciplined force with a lot of experience in battle. They expected to find little adversity in Scotland's rebels. Scottish numbers were around four to 5,000 infantry and around 180 horses. They came together in factions, an amalgamation of Murray and Wallace's rebel companies. However, even though the British thought all of these men were outlaws and criminals or plain farmers, many of these men also had battle experience. Both Murray and Wallace also had the ability to train, command and lead an army. And it wasn't that hard to motivate these men, fighting for their very independence. That wasn't the only thing in favour for the Scottish that day. The location of Stirling Bridge, though a pivotal area, was an unfortunate one for a pitch battle. The bridge's width would only permit two horses to cross at once, making the estimated time for the entire army to arrive on the other side of the river to be just over several hours, putting the English in an extremely vulnerable position. Furthermore, the English were trained in traditional combat and relied heavily upon their superior heavy cavalry. So the whole army was stuck on one side of the bridge and they didn't have their go-to tactic of choice. The ground quality was soft and extremely muddy, so even after crossing the bridge, they had a lot of trouble. Once about a third of the army crossed the bridge, stuck in the mud and surrounded by three sides of the river, the English would soon discover that this was a pretty great place for an ambush. And an ambush they got. What makes this battle even better is the reports of Warren's arrogance. Warren hoped for a quick and easy peace. 
He was confident that English would win and he'd rather negotiate than having to bother fighting. After delaying the battle several times, pausing to knight some men, he sent two friars to the Scottish camp to propose a negotiation. The Scottish response to this suggestion actually is documented and famously noted in Wallace's first recorded patriotic speech. We have not come in search of peace, but to do battle in order to free ourselves and liberate our kingdom. So let them come up to meet us if they wish, and they will find us prepared against our very beards. With that, the conflict was unavoidable, and the English finally had to prepare for battle. Sir Richard Lundy is recorded having suggested instead an ulterior route for the contingent of men to allow the English to encircle the Scottish by simultaneously attacking from the behind. Hugh de Cressingham, Edward I's treasurer, urged against this suggestion, advocating instead for a swift and easy victory. Warren sided with Cressington, disregarded these warnings and pushed ahead with a direct attack. A code of honour is always in place during battle, and one must fight fairly to win. The English believed that a part of this honour would be to allow the English to cross and then to begin the battle. But the Scots had a bit of a different plan, and a tactically sound argument for doing so. One division specifically directing their attention to the bridge itself in order to cut off escape leaving the rest of the English army surprised and stranded on the other side of the bridge. The Scottish won a great victory at the Battle of Stirling Bridge, killing just over half of the English forces and watching as the rest retreated from the scene. Scotland's defiance of Edward's control, refusal of negotiation, disobedience of the presumed code of conduct of war and their achievement in victory show us the significance of this battle. But what about the direct consequences? Once Warren had fled from the battle, he led his men to Berwick Castle, rather than to Stirling Castle, where the English had garrisoned. By his actions, leaving the rest of his men deserted, Stirling Castle was soon forced to be surrendered to the Scottish. From the spreading news, the English garrisons at Dundee Castle to the east also relinquished their stronghold the last remaining bastion of English control. From the one defeat at Stirling and Warren's actions, this one defeat brought about the collapse of English occupation in Scotland, returning its control to the people. Furthermore, for the Scottish, an influential victory so early on was a compelling source of morale. As the first major battle of the Wars of Independence, Stirling can be seen as a message from the people of Scotland, the official statement of defiance against the English conquest. Not only was this the first account of a highly trained cavalry army being defeated by a formation of amateur rebels, but this was also the first time since the 11th century that an English army had been outdone by Scottish opponents. These Scots have achieved the improbable task of shattering the myth of English invincibility. Wallace and Murray also reaped the rewards of their success. Both leaders began to refer to themselves rather highly. No longer the rebellion leaders, they became Andrew de Murray and William Wallace, leaders of the army of the Kingdom of Scotland and the community of the same kingdom. This quote is from the Lübeck Letter, a political letter to the town in modern-day Germany, claiming that the trading parts of Scotland are to be opened and in business, after the kingdom had been recovered from the power of the English. This shows that the Scottish believed that they had succeeded. Unfortunately for Murray and Wallace, this new spotlight was short-lived. Andrew Murray died shortly after or possibly during the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Wallace was knighted and installed as a guardian of Scotland. After Stirling, King Edward's efforts became more concentrated on retrieving control over Scotland. Months later, in July 1298, Edward himself led another force into Stirling at the Battle of Falkirk, this time facing Wallace himself. Now, this was a pitch battle, leaving less opportunity for ambush and trickery. The Scottish suffered a major defeat. Retreating from the battle, 
Probably a little embarrassed, Wallace relinquished his title as guardian and left the country for France for a few years. He returned in 1304 to Scotland, only to be quickly captured and executed by the English. Though his life was short and his victory at Stirling essentially inconsequential, his legacy lives on. Perhaps the most recognisable figure of Scotland's history to this day is William Wallace. His reputation coming out of the Wars of Independence is a major indication of the importance of his victory at Stirling Bridge. Now, we didn't hear too much about Wallace directly until 1470, when a poet named Blind Harry wrote of Wallace's brave deeds and fierce fight for freedom. And since then, his image has inspired many other writers in similar ways, including Robert Burns, William Wordsworth and Sir Walter Scott. Wallace became a national symbol and a heroic figure, but this figure of Wallace has been shaped and interpreted in so many different ways by each society since the real Wallace led his army at Stirling Bridge. Because little is known of the real Wallace himself, it was so much more easier to mould him to however the audience wanted to picture him. The perception of Wallace did remain strong throughout the early modern age and into the Victorian era, where they funded and erected a monument in his name. The Wallace Monument stood over Stirling since 1869, but until 2015 no memorial existed on the battleground itself to inform visitors of its significance. And unfortunately, Wallace has taken much of the credit. Murray, on the other hand, has been cast by historians as Scotland's forgotten hero. Three granite plinths have since been placed to commemorate both Wallace, Murray, and the battle itself in May of 2015, in hopes to educate everyone to the roles that both men had played in their victory. The most pivotal effect on Wallace's image was notably the film Braveheart, released in 1995 to much success. Though taking many, many liberties with the historical inaccuracies of Wallace's tale, to say the least, the lack of the bridge at the Battle of Stirling Bridge, it took many guesses into the unknown. The film was a hit with the popular masses, inspiring new fascinations with the Scottish drive for independence and Wallace's defeat of his English foes. After the film's release, Stirling experienced a boom in tourism to the site, an almost 150% increase to the visitation of the monument itself. William Wallace himself stood for independence, and though he likely did not yell for freedom, the sentiment was there. This battle, amongst other things, created a national hero. As Scottish independence came up once again in 2014, with the Scottish referendum, Stirling and Wallace once again became idealised as national symbols of independence against English arrogance. In summary, visit Scotland. It's amazing. And always read the plaques, because that one film about that thing from history isn't always the best representation of what actually happened. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to hear more about weird stories from history. And goodbye for now.